Coming up on South Coast Spotlight, journey with us to the Santa Barbara Zoo, where the two newest additions have attracted quite a crowd. Be inspired by local artists who are getting creative to save the environment and soar sky high at our local kite festival. All that and more coming up on South Coast Spotlight. Hi everyone, welcome to South Coast Spotlight. I'm Dominique Samario. In this program, we'll take you around the South Coast to explore what brings our community to life. Many people know someone who fought in the Vietnam War. And chances are, you might know a man or woman who have served in our most recent conflicts. But few will ever meet one of the soldiers who fought in what they call the Great War. TVSB was honored to meet four of these men who were recently celebrated by local organizations. Spend a day around the South Coast and you'll likely be exposed to history. From downtown Santa Barbara's El Presidio and the Stowe House in Goleta to Chumash Relics and Mission Santa Barbara. But there is another type of local history that many residents may not be aware of. The kind of history that comes not from a place, but from people and an annual event is doing what it can to make sure that this history, these people, are never forgotten. I'd like to especially welcome our four bomber boys. We're so proud of you. These four men are a piece of history. They were honored by the Pierre Clayson's Veteran Museum and the Channel City Club so that those who serve aren't quickly forgotten. It's a feeling of, uh, of doing something good for the community because we, we need to recognize people who go put their lives on the line for all of us. To get to know these four Santa Barbara veterans is to learn about four young men who all stood behind the same cause and then had it forever change their lives. For Lieutenant Larry Crandell, who went on to fly 35 missions, joining the Army Air Corps was a defining moment in his life. I was either going to be drafted or try to be in the Air Corps. I became a bombardier navigator, which meant I became an officer. And that was a single act that most defined me. When they put the, silver, the gold bars and the wings on me. When I got out of the service, I went to college. I became a college graduate. Colonel James Petillo dropped out of college at the age of 19 in order to join the Army Air Corps and then retired after 20 years of service. For Colonel Petillo, this event gave him the opportunity to share his stories about those who served with him. I enjoyed talking about some of the great friends we made in the Army Air Corps because there just, there just seems that uh, there were some of the greatest people in the world. And um, I wouldn't have missed it for anything in the world. Staff Sergeant Jack Patterson entered the service in 1943 as an aviation cadet with hopes of being a pilot. But with no need for them at the time, he instead went on to become a gunner on B-24, B-25, and B-17 planes, flying 30 missions before returning home in 1945. The ones of us who did fly, we were all volunteers. We had a pretty good idea of what might happen to us. And from my standpoint, it, it, I feel it was an, an honor to be a part of that. Shortly after Pearl Harbor, Bob Scott joined the Army Air Corps, eventually becoming a second lieutenant and flying 30 missions with the 492nd Bomb Group in England. I think it's a good thing to make people aware of what went on at a time when uh, this country was, was united, totally united after Pearl Harbor. We were one people. I don't think it's ever been like that since. I doubt if it ever was before. These Army Air Corps men inspire great pride with their incredible contribution to the Great War, surviving against odds that seem to say them being here today is nothing short of a miracle. The stories they have shared with us today 
are an important contribution to our nation's oral history. And hearing you today really makes me very proud to be an American, and thank you so much for your service and for sharing your stories with us today. While the United States suffered many losses during World War II, those in the Army Air Corps, or Bomber Boys as we call them now, lost their lives most frequently due to the highly dangerous nature of their job. In World War II, out of every thousand Army troops, 24 were killed in combat. Out of every 1,000 Marines, 29 were killed in combat. Out of every 1,000 Army Air Corps, 240 were killed in combat. The bomber stayed at altitude and stayed on heading, so the flak and the fighters just uh, were able to decimate many, many of them. The Germans set up a terrific system where if you flew into a box of the sky and they knew the altitude, so they would put all their guns into that one box and boy, it was really something. Your life expectancy was seven missions. So you were supposed to do 25, but your life expectancy was seven. They were the real heroes, the ones that came up day after day as human targets for every weapon of an ingenious, dedicated, and tenacious enemy could use against them. So in life itself, the true measure of courage is to fly on despite the tragedies of accident, sickness, and failure. And fly on, these four men did. Through sharing their very personal stories with the crowd, the audience got a glimpse of the life that was a World War II bomber boy. That meant there was a B-29 up there in the smoke, and the lights were all instructed at that point of the war to concentrate on one airplane, and every gun in town had one target, and that was it. <laughs> it was perhaps 20 or so minutes, and lo and behold, we arrived at the beginning of the bomb run. Now, there were as many B-29s up there, each with a crew of 11 men, as there are people, you, us, we, sitting here in this room today. But of the original 70 planes and crews after those 89 days, all but 16, all but 16 of 70 had gone down over Germany. That we weren't going to make it back to the base. So I asked what I thought was an intelligent question. What should we do? <laughs> <laughs> and he answered, I'll leave out the profanity. We're going to take the airplane and I'm going to put it as gently as possible into the Adriatic Sea. I immediately felt better, and that good feeling continued until the plane hit the water at 100 miles an hour. I, I'm a survivor, I'm not a hero, and I'm a very lucky boy, and I'm very happy to be here. In many ways, the opportunity to share their stories is a gift to the veterans, while for those with the chance to listen, the honor was all theirs. They feel the admiration and the recognition and the, the respect that we pay them. Uh, that's really important for them. You got to understand they're all 90 years old. They're at the end of their uh, lives and they're wondering, this is really an important thing for them. A quote by Pierre Clayton's, the benefactor of the future Pierre Clayton's Veteran Museum and Library, eloquently sums up the inspiration for both the museum and this event. To die in war is not the worst. To be, uh, be missing in the war is not the worst. To be forgotten is the worst. And that's our important thing with us, is trying to do things to bring recognition to these men. And uh, then we'll be the Koreans, and then Korean veterans, and then we'll be Vietnam. All the people that served this country. So uh, we can't forget about it. With the support of local organizations, these men and the others who served will never face that fate.
When you think of newborns, you probably think of how tiny they are. But in our next story, TVSB introduces you to two adorable but rather large infants who break this mold. Join us as we visit them at the Santa Barbara Zoo. The Santa Barbara Zoo, located at 500 Ninos Drive, is the beautiful home to an assortment of animals that come in all different shapes, sizes, and colors. But what has people really excited are the newest and youngest additions that also just happen to be quite large for their age. Here at the Santa Barbara Zoo, viewers can see not just one newborn baby giraffe, but two. Although they are young, they are already heavier and taller than me, and they may grow to be as tall as their parents here behind me. Meet Dane and Sunshine. They each stand over six feet and weigh over 130 pounds. Other than their incredible size, what exactly is so exciting about the Santa Barbara Zoo housing these two newborn giraffes? Baby Maasai giraffes are, in my opinion, being a giraffe keeper, very exciting. Um, they are um, a threatened species too, uh, so that makes it exciting. There's only about 90 um, Maasai giraffes in North America in captive, at captivity. Um, and so our goal here for our giraffe herd is to reproduce um, and bring that population up. With only 90 Maasai giraffes in North America and the population worldwide declining rapidly, it is a unique opportunity to see them up close and in person and to observe their interactions together as a family. It's so exciting when we see um, whether the babies are interacting with each other or their mothers or um, the other female that may not even be their mom. Um, every day it's something different and it's something new for the babies. Uh, so we're, we get so excited about how their relationships start to grow. And grow they will, particularly in size. However, Dane and Sunshine will not be staying in Santa Barbara for as long as we may have hoped. Sunshine and Dane will be with us here at Santa Barbara for um, probably a minimum of two years. Um, not much longer than that though. Um, what we'll probably do is to, again, keep that um, population growing, ship those um, two out to other facilities where they can go on and breed also. Every bird must leave the nest, as they say, and Dane and Sunshine are no exception. Yet, these will likely not be the last baby Maasai giraffes that Santa Barbarans will have the chance to experience. The reason we have our, our bull male Michael here is to do that. He was brought in from Ontario, Canada to be the number one a Maasai breeding bull. So he will stay here. Um, whether or not Audrey and Betty Lou stay but, um, will depend on the higher ups. Uh, but yes, our facility here at Santa Barbara is to breed giraffes and breed Maasai giraffes. So head on over to see Dane and Sunshine here at the Santa Barbara Zoo, where the view of the animals and the ocean are simply exquisite. In Santa Barbara County, we're lucky enough to be surrounded by natural beauty. Up next, you'll be amazed by local artists who captured this beauty for the very purpose of sustaining it. Santa Barbara's beautiful topography presents itself in many areas, especially the Gaviota Coast. Many residents enjoy this unique landscape. However, a few local groups have recognized its need for preservation. Well, uh, Na Naples is a key piece of the Gaviota Coast, and it is the, the property on the Gaviota Coast that's, that's really been under the most significant imminent threat of, of being lost forever. Anyone who spent any time in Southern California knows the big threats to uh, to, to the natural landscape here, the biggest driver being coastal development. Uh, people are unfortunately literally loving their coastline to death in the form of, uh, of uh, unwise construction and really forgetting about the, the many century heritage of, of farming and of, uh, of open space, of wildlife, uh, of wildlife habitat that we have here on the coast. And so what remains here um, along Gaviota is absolutely a precious. You can see from the interest in this in this art show and from the enthusiasm that uh, that people show at Naples or or Gaviota Coast events, at public hearings and on the outings that we that we sponsor out to, to actually physically see the coast um, and the properties that we're talking about. Um, you know, people are really voting with their feet and showing their love for the for the coastline. Well, there's a lot of challenges now to the Gaviota Coast for development, and Naples being one of the ones that are at, that's at the forefront right now. And part of this money is going towards the Save Naples, the Naples Coalition. And that is a project that has been in flux for quite a while, and we're working to 
figure out a way to preserve that property. The Naples Coalition has been working mainly on the Naples property, but we know that whatever affects part of the coast will affect all of it. So we keep track of all the different projects and talk to the owners of the other lands and try to get it so that people can preserve this important resource for future generations. Because we feel very passionate about everyone should have the opportunity to be able to experience what we've been privileged to experience. The preservation of the landscape is a community effort that anyone can be a part of, and organizations such as Naples, SCAPE, and the Gaviota Coast Conservancy have made it easier to get involved. The beauty of the Gaviota Coast and the Naples property sort of sells itself, if you will. People see it. Um, and they, they simply fall in love. They see a spirit there that they connect with and that they want to preserve. Um, so we, what we have today is really a visual celebration uh, of, of the Gaviota Coast and of Naples in photography and painting. And it's, 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 really, it, it's really for us the way to, to connect people and show people what's at stake. Um, and it, you know, we, most of our events um, lately have been um, aimed at either visual depiction of the, of the precious resources that are there, of the beauty of it, or we emphasize actually going out and visiting the Naples property, which is, uh, is something that you can do and, and take a hike or go for a surf or you know, really stand, stand there and take in a sunset. And that's, that's the way that people really connect with what their values are and, and really assign them to protecting the Gaviota Coast and being a, being a part of this. It's, a, it's become a very big, one of the community's biggest conservation efforts. Um, and it's just so well populated with many, many people who have a personal connection to the coast and want to see that uh, preserved and want to be able to hand that down to future generations. I think the, the most important thing really is that we, people have covered a lot of the rest of California we ought to at least preserve part of it, specifically the coast, so that future generations can enjoy the same resources and see the same things that we've been privileged to see. That the coast and its beautiful resources aren't, unfortunately they aren't for free. It takes, a, it takes involvement, it takes people chipping in, being a part of these events, uh, coming to hearings and being engaged in their, uh, you know, being engaged in the future of their coastline. So it's, a, it's an asset that was handed down to us and we have to do our part. Sit back, relax, and have some fun as we watch locals of all ages fly their kites to the highest heights at the 28th Annual Santa Barbara Kite Festival. family style festival. Um, families have grown up with this festival. Literally, you know, I'll meet a five-year-old who, who leaves the festival as a 15-year-old. Anybody can do it. Anyone can do it. Anyone can do it. Um, but I, I was just talking to some kids here today, they, if it wasn't for the festival, they would have never flown a kite. And that's what I like about the festival, that it introduces to families flying. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you, you grab your dad, you grab your mom, you grab your brother or sister, and you say, okay, run over there and hold the kite and then let's go crash it and you crash it and you crash it and then you go okay and then it finally takes off and you blame the wind or somehow feel lucky that you found the right day for kite flying but almost every day is a good day to kite fly. Some days are better than others but uh, I'd like to think every day is a good day for kite flying. My parents were not very happy when you're flying kites and not going to school. I started this festival 28 years ago. Every time you go out fly a kite you see so much interest. People want to fly a kite, will part of it, and they want to know more about it. So this is a good way to come and see a different shape of kite. People come from all over different countries, different part of the country. Children. Children? Yeah. Okay. You I, I make them happy. <laughs> yep. And they make me happy. You're, you're, you're missing out big, big thing in your life. You don't fly a kite. It's an extension to life, like you are 
flying, this is the best thing you can do, closest, without getting hurt. You're born with it. Same way you're born with the kites. It's, it's around you. It's very much part of the culture. Right here at the harbor, visitors to the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum are exposed to exquisite views of both the ocean and wildlife. A new exhibit at the museum highlights this beauty through art. Many people visit the Santa Barbara Harbor for the view, to see local wildlife, and to experience a part of Santa Barbara's history. One place that tourists come to is the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum. This is a place for the entire family where they can explore the exhibits as well as hands-on experience with seeing the oceanfront from a different lens, animation in the kids' corner, and digitalized fishing. But recently, visitors can find something new, something that they might not expect to find at the waterfront, local art. a postcard about three and a half years ago to our gallery and it was about a, 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 a home studio tour of artists in Carpinteria and I took one look at the card and at her bird painting and I called her and I said can you come to our gallery? Kim Snyder is a talented Santa Barbara native who has an eye for the local wildlife especially birds. I just love watching it. Yeah, I think that's the whole inspiration is just watching these creatures and not getting too close to bother them. So you have a telephoto, but um, but just watching them go about their daily life and you know they usually notice I'm there and I'll back off if I see them starting to retreat. But usually they see that I'm not bothering them and I'll look away for a while and, and then look back and, and just them letting me kind of get on their everyday life. We may not notice how much beauty local wildlife adds to the Santa Barbara scenery, but Kim Snyder's work inspires us to take another look. As an artist for over 20 years, Kim Snyder encourages young aspiring artists to do what they love and to never give up on their dreams. Do what you love. It's, it's so easy and I still do get caught up in, you know, oh, what are, what's, what's the big thing now, or look what they're doing, I've got to try that, but if you can remember to do what you love um, and paint the way you want to. These larger-than-life paintings will be on display and for sale at the Santa Barbara Maritime Museum until the end of June. Santa Barbara's focus on sustainability in the environment have drawn in crowds since 1970 with the first Earth Day celebration. Since then, the festival has grown, attracting more people and support for the cause. TVSV checked out the exhibits to find out what we can all do to help the environment. Hey, all right, Santa Barbara, California. What's happening, my friends? What is today? Earth Day! Earth Day is a day where environmental protection is celebrated globally. The festival makes time to not only celebrate, but to show off technology that would be safer for the environment. Planet Solar. Planet Solar donated what right now is a 10 kW system as phase one of a total of 25 kW. But the system that exists right now here at the Spotlight Pavilion is 10 kW and it is enough solar energy to offset every concert that they do at the Santa Barbara Bowl. Alternative transportation is also emphasized on this day. Riding bikes is one way to protect the earth. At the Earth Day Festival they offered free bike valet services which kept bikes safe and encouraged visitors to help the environment. The bus is another form of transportation. This bus here has the equivalent of six Priuses on the roof and battery packs and a 5.9 liter Cummins diesel engine about what you find in a Dodge pickup truck. We have 18 hydroelectric buses because they're much more fuel efficient and they're also quieter. They are good for the environment. While the festival is used to show off developments in environmentally friendly technology, 
many families come to have a good time. It is also a good way to inform the public on ways they can help. We're gonna go ahead and try LEDs, the most energy efficient. It's not that hard. CFL might require a little bit more pedaling. Then this is the incandescent, it's the least energy efficient. Go ahead and pedal. Pedal, 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 keep it lit. See how much more energy you need to use. Until the next Earth Day Festival, look for small ways you can positively help the environment. Be sure to continue to join us on South Coast Spotlight for a look at the arts, culture, and community that make up the South Coast. If you have ideas for future stories, email us at info at tvsb.tv. Thanks for watching, and until next time, get out and explore your South Coast.